welcome to our online worship for the week for Long Creek and Dalton City United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Haley, and I'm so glad that you've joined in our worship today. We'll start with our call to worship, which is Psalm 8. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are evil. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all humankind to see if there is anyone who understand any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all those evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gladness and the goodness that we can find in you. We thank you that salvation has come. We thank you, God, for Jesus and for your love for us. God, tune our hearts into yours as we worship you today. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. <laughs> now the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Stay tuned for our sermon. A house divided against itself cannot stand. On June 16, 1858, at the Illinois Republican Convention in Springfield, so not too far from where I am in Decatur, Abraham Lincoln officially kicked off his bid for the U.S. Senate seat with this speech that would come to be known as the House Divided Speech. Abraham Lincoln famously said it, but Jesus said it long before Abe even thought about it. In Matthew 12, 15, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. We'll see today that the house of Israel has set the example of a united nation becoming a divided nation. 
We're in a series called Loyally Yours on the Kings in the Old Testament. If you want to dig in further and talk more about, learn more about trusting in God, I highly recommend this study by Lisa Turkhurst on Trustworthy about First and Second Kings. So we are talking about First and Second Kings today. Last week we talked about King Solomon. God gave Solomon the opportunity to ask for whatever he wanted. Solomon was wise enough to ask God for wisdom. He knew that he couldn't um, be in charge of all the people on his own and he needed some help. So he asked God for wisdom. Wisdom gave Solomon this incredible gift for leadership insights and how to rule the people. And he was admired by people near and far. Solomon had the wisdom to settle disputes and bring justice. Even though Solomon was given the gift of wisdom, he still made some very unwise choices when it came to his love life. His wives caused his heart to turn away from worshiping God, capital G-O-D, and instead he began to worship God's, lowercase g-o-d-s. That was a no-no and it helped to turn his heart away from God, the one who was worthy of all of his worship and worthy of our, all of our worship. Wisdom without obedience to God does not produce the kind of life that God wants us to be living and leading. Apparently, Solomon forgot about what happened to King Saul and what God had told Solomon to walk faithfully with him and follow him obediently, and he would live along a prosperous life, and he would continue to have a ruler, an heir on the throne. Solomon was not walking wholeheartedly with God. He was not following God obediently by the end of his life. He worshiped gods and built high places to make sacrifices to these gods. It is not enough for us to have wisdom, but we must also do what God says to do. We have to follow obediently. It's not enough for us to have wisdom or teach wisdom or receive wisdom or preach wisdom. We also have to walk faithfully with God and do what God calls us and tells us to do. Disobedience often leads to devastation in one way or another. If nothing else, it robs us of our peace that God gives us when we walk obediently and faithfully with him. We'll see today that Solomon's divided heart leads to the kingdom becoming divided. And a house divided cannot stand, as Jesus and Lincoln famously said. A divided Israel becomes two kingdoms that have a hard time finding peace. We get a long-running battle between the North and the South a long time before we have our U.S. Civil War. We pick up the story in 1 Kings 11 today. Solomon has been reigning as king, and he ends up reigning for 40 years until his death, and his son Rehoboam will succeed him as king. In 1 Kings 11:26, we meet a man named Jeroboam. King Solomon saw potential and skill and ability in Jeroboam, and he appointed him as a commissioner or the head of labor work for the house of Joseph. While serving Solomon, Jeroboam saw how Solomon was ruling the people and about the harsh labor that he was having them to do as they built the palace and the temple. Solomon's behavior was self-serving and the people suffered. Before Solomon dies, Jeroboam rebels against Solomon because of the harshness he's put on the people. One day, as Jeroboam is going out of Jerusalem, he meets the prophet Ahijah. Now, Ahijah is wearing a brand new cloak, but he takes it off and he tears it into 12 pieces. He tells Jeroboam to take 10 pieces of this cloth. Ahijah tells Jeroboam about what God is about to do. The cloak pieces are symbolic of Israel. God is going to give Jeroboam 10 tribes of Israel to rule over. Solomon's family line for the sake of David and the promises that God made to David will get to keep what remains. Picking up the story in 1 Kings 11 verse 31, we see where Jeroboam has received these 10 pieces of the cloak from Ahijah and this is what happens. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, 
the goddess of the Sidians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in obedience to me, nor done what is right in the eyes of the Lord, or nor kept my decrees and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who obeyed my de commands and decrees. I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command, you walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David my servant did. I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak the king and stayed there until Solomon's death. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the books of the annuals? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over Israel 40 years. Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. After Solomon dies, Rehoboam becomes king. The Israelites and Jeroboam, who's come back from Egypt because he heard Solomon died, he comes back and they plead with Rehoboam to lessen the labor that Solomon has put on them. Rehoboam asks for three days to think about it, to consider their request. Rehoboam wisely asks the elders of Israel for some help here with what he should do. In 1 Kings 12, 6 through 8, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? He asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. The elders try and teach and tell Rehoboam what he needs to do in order to be successful as king. He has to serve the people. However, Rehoboam rejects their advice and he goes to listen to his friends instead. He's not going to listen the people's load. Instead, he's going to do what his friends say and he's going to make the load even heavier. He's going to cause harsher labor to be put into place. The decision ends up leading to the division of the kingdom. Just as Ahijah had prophesied and told Jeroboam, the kingdom is torn in two. The ten northern tribes of Israel reject Rehoboam as their king, and they establish Jeroboam as their king. The tribe of Judah and the smaller Benjamin tribe that is next to them, their neighbor, they stay loyal to Rehoboam and the former and form the southern kingdom. What was once a united kingdom becomes a divided kingdom. Jeroboam and Rehoboam are both now given the opportunity to lead God's people. How are they going to do? Will they be like Saul and live against God with a divided heart? Or will they be like David and be men after God's heart? Or will they be like Solomon and live half-heartedly, half worshiping God and half worshiping other things? Spoiler alert, there's a reason why you may have never heard the names Rehoboam or Jeroboam before today. There are lots of men named David, but not very many men that I know, or maybe even none that I know, named Rehoboam or Jeroboam. So, Jeroboam is leading the ten northern tribes. He has this unique opportunity to turn things around and help the people and lead them to follow the Lord. But instead of following God's instructions, Jeroboam comes up with his own plan. Out of fear, he deviates from God's instructions and leads the people astray. 
Jeroboam decides that he does not want the people to return to the temple in Israel because he is afraid that the people will want to return to Jeroboam's rule. Jeroboam says that he doesn't want the people to travel so far, but that's not the whole truth of why he doesn't want the people to go. He is afraid. He's fearful that he's going to lose his kingdom. He builds two golden calves for them to worship instead. Sound familiar? Apparently, they forgot about Aaron and what happened with Israel when he built the golden calf. The traveling distance really wasn't what Jeroboam was concerned about. He created a solution to help ease his own fear. If he could keep the people from going to Jerusalem, he could keep them away from being wowed by Jeroboam and the ways that he was ruling. Jeroboam was afraid of losing the people and his own power being threatened. His own fear caused himself and others to sin. The people were worshiping idols and not God. Jeroboam's reaction is a sign of him not fully trusting God. Instead of trusting God, the one who had called him to be king, he is leading people away from God. He's doing this by causing them to not go to the temple to worship. He's encouraging the people to be dishonoring to God in this act of idol worship. While we may not be building calves out of gold to worship, sometimes we also disobey God and worship things that we should not. While we may not build our idols and blatantly disobey God like Jeroboam was doing here, what parts of our lives are we not trusting God fully with? What have we put ahead of God's best for our lives? What fears are we allowing to get in the way of our faith? When we refuse to follow in obedience to God, we refuse to be a recipient of God's peace that he gives to us when we say yes and follow obediently to him. Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam sacrificed their peace on the altar of disobedience. Might we be wiser and not follow their example? May we not sacrifice our peace because of our own disobedience. May we follow God wholeheartedly. Jeroboam and Rehoboam's story points us to God's faithfulness. Once again, the people are not being faithful to God, but God remains faithful to his servants. Again, God is faithful in keeping God's promises to his to his servant David and David's household, despite the people's unfaithfulness, God continues to give David's family line people to rule over a king on the throne because of David's faithfulness and wholeheartedness toward God. God kept God's word to David. God left a remnant for David's sake. Two tribes stay loyal to Jeroboam, David's grandson and his family line, and God continues to keep God's promises just as God continues to keep God's promises to us today. Jeroboam and Rehoboam's story also reminds us of God's sovereignty, that it can't be overridden by some human will. Solomon wanted to kill off Jeroboam before he even had a chance to be king. He wasn't successful in that. God's will overrode Solomon's will. Once again, God's sovereign will overrides human desire. It's one more way that shows us how God is trustworthy. God's word remains faithful and true. And God cannot be manipulated by human will or human actions. This story also points to our need for help outside of ourselves. The stuff that happens in this story about disobedience and idol worship is evidence of history repeating itself again. Jeroboam didn't come up with the ideal to build a calf to worship or to have idol worship. That stuff had already happened in the past. If we are not careful, history might repeat itself with us as well. We may not build a calf to worship, but we will worship something else besides God. Same sin, different year, different person. We have to be changed and transformed. We need God's help in order for the narrative to change. We have to be changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We have to allow God to lead us. We have to surrender our hearts to him. We have to be careful about who and what we let rule our hearts and our minds. Whatever captivates our hearts will fuel our actions. We must always go back to the truth of God's word and keep that truth front and center in our lives. Jeroboam started out with some really good intentions. He wanted the people to have their labor, lo labor load lessened, but by the end, his motivations were not good anymore. Over time, Jeroboam lost track of what was most important. He built idols for people to worship in a place where they didn't need to be worshiping them. He built idols for people to worship instead of going to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. He did it out of fear that the people would rebel against him and be loyal to Jeroboam again. We ourselves need to do a heart check and a mind check. What is our motivation? Jeroboam's motivation was his fear. No matter who we are or what our callings are, we influence other people and we are influenced by other people. Big and small, we cause some sort of chain reaction with the influence that we have. So what are our motivations? We have to keep checking our motivations. We have to be honest about our intentions. What's our motivation? As the newsboys have famously sung, what's our motivation? Tainted motivations lead to misguided intentions that can lead to flat out disobedience to God. So we have to keep our hearts and our minds in check. We have to watch our doubts too. Doubts often start in the heart and in the mind. In 1 Kings 12, 26, Jeroboam said in his heart that he thought the kingdom would likely revert to the line of David. He kept telling that to himself over and over, I imagine, and fear set in. Fear set in for him because of the doubts the narrative or the story or whatever he was telling himself over and over. We have to watch our thoughts. We have to be transformed. We have to allow God to transform us and change us from the inside out. And that includes our thought life too. No more stinking thinking. As we talked last time, our hearts can lead us astray. The Bible talks about that a lot. We have to guard our hearts and our minds we have to watch what we have on repeat in our thought life and what's going on in our hearts and in our heads. No one speaks to us more than we speak to ourselves. So what is it that you are saying to you? What's on repeat? What's the thing, the tape that you keep telling yourself? Perhaps we need a new mixed tape. Rehoboam's story is also a warning to watch who we listen to, too. There's a saying that you have to watch who you hang out with. You become the people that you surround yourself with. We need to surround ourselves with good, godly, wise people. But more than that, we also have to listen to them when they give us this good, godly, wise advice. Rehoboam listened to his friends and not the wise elders who had been serving the kingdom for a long time. For us who are in Christ Jesus, we must also listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. What is God saying? Not what are people saying, but what is God saying? And not just to listen to what God is saying, but to do it, to be obedient when the Spirit speaks. It can be scary to listen to God's leading if you're just beginning to do it, or even sometimes when you've been doing it a long time. It can be scary, but God is trustworthy and God is faithful. The safest place for us to be is in the center of God's will. I'll repeat it. The safest place for us to be is in the center of God's will. God always has our best interest in mind. Do we trust God to lead us safely and securely? Do we follow God wholeheartedly? Who is it that you are trusting? Who are you trusting? Jeroboam was not resting securely and safely and peacefully in the promises that God had given him. He was trusting in himself. He was trusting that he had a better plan than what God might have. He was operating from a place of fear and not a place of faith. 
He was focused in on his own identity and not the fact that God was the one who had appointed and anointed and chosen him as king. Do we trust God? We distrust God when we are fearful of losing control. We see that here with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. We distrust God when we are fearful of losing control. When we try to take control, we ultimately leave no room for God to be God. So who is in control? Is it God? Is it you? Is it someone else? The safest place for us to be is in the center of God's will. So surrender your control over to God and allow God to be in control because God is trustworthy and worthy of all of our worship. May we be wise and heed Rehoboam and Jeroboam's bad example and wisely follow instead wholeheartedly after God. May we live lives motivated by faith and not our fear. And let us pray. God, help us as we journey in this life to follow you faithfully. We know, Lord, that you have your best interest in mind for us. So help us to surrender control over to you. Help us to follow you wholeheartedly. God, change and transform and renew our thoughts and our minds and our hearts, Lord. And may we live lives that follow you faithfully. May we make wise choices, Lord, and help others to know you more. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.